Hey guys. All, All right. right. Wait one. So, where did it start hey, off? Hey Tyra, we here. Tyra said she's waiting. Do I need to move the screen over? I'll move it in the middle. Not quite. Okay. So, how is the discipleship program going? I'd say it's going pretty good. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> I've been able to tell a shift in not only uh, my thinking and uh, relationship with the Father, but I could see a change in Jared already. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. How about you? Yeah, I think just the, the thing Chew. one of them is the way uh, I think the way um, I read the scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, because before it was just kind of a to do list, and okay, we're done here. Check that to do list, but to really like delve into, especially those particular scriptures, and see you know where they're you know where they're going, and then being able to bring them to you, Tammy, mm -hmm. and us just kind of expound on it, yep. especially the part with like I said, talking about the Holy Spirit right. and. Um, you know, spending time with him and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think it's just, like, really delving into that scripture and really looking at what God meant uh, by it instead of it just being like something kind of that checklist. Tyra and I have also been taking it into the jails, trying to focus on kind of what we're focusing on okay. and trying to do that, too. But um, one thing, uh, Mandy and I had a gift this week. Mm -hmm. My God, we were talking about praying in tongues and flowing mm -hmm. in the Holy Spirit and things like that, and um, we really spent some time talking about flowing. Well, then my goddaughter was inside while Mandy and I were outside. She wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ah. So since Mandy and I both were already filled with the Holy Spirit and, or baptized in the Holy Spirit, Brianna got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and, and boy. And, and I don't know anybody that that's born again and all that. It's, you talk about what, the word revival. That just like pumps you up. It's like a pep rally. You, you know, you, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and it's great, but when somebody new gets filled with the Holy Spirit, it's like, yes! You forget yeah. that that rush. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. And the scripture that kept coming to me, and I don't know the book and all that, but uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength, like as we were yes. praying over. Mm -hmm. Like, she's got so much joy and like... And like she's going was, through the hardest yeah. time in her life right now personally. I'm not going to put that out yeah, there, but yeah. she's going through some hard times. Mm -hmm. And she's just growing, 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 mm -hmm. growing, growing. And she's like, she got baptized. For those of y'all that don't know, she got baptized in a feeding trough out here, a watering trough that we had to break about four inches of solid ice off of it for her to get in it. But she meant she wasn't waiting. Mm -hmm. So, that's dedication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Michelle, what about you? Um, I know we're just, I feel like me and Tyra is just having a great, not just a great time, we're just, I mean, hours. Right, mm -hmm. David? Yeah. I mean, me and her will meet at our house, and then Scott and David usually go off, meet at a park or something, mm -hmm. you know, so we do it at the same time pretty much. But yeah, yeah we do. it's been really, really good growing and seeing new things and understanding the word in a new way mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of new revelations coming out. Well, y'all both bring a lot to the table. And, yeah. and in terms of my visions, when I first started, like the Lord started me smiling and showing me me. And then he's progressed that some, but lately I've been seeing, how do I say this, more of, um, I guess, the devil's stuff. The yeah. Stuff, him a bit but I can handle it. Like, oh, yeah. Because if, I'd have got, if that would been my first vision, like some of the stuff that he's showing me, I'd have been like, I'm good. Um, so that's one thing I've noticed too, is I guess just the growing also with my vision as well. Right. And we prayed with um, Brianna. She got a she got a extra oomph because we were talking about flowing, so we went back out there and prayed and boy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Mandy and I started flowing together and then um, Brianna did and it was it was cool like Picking up on the same things in the spirit, and if y'all ain't never prayed together and played together in the spirit, y'all missing it. Oh yeah, because it's awesome. it is it's immediate confirmation that what you're seeing is from God. Mm -hmm. 
because the other person is picking up on the mm -hmm. same thing and you start and it's like finishing each other's sentences in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Literally f finishing each other's visions in the spirit. Mm -hmm. And there just ain't nothing like that. that mm -hmm. I mean, that's awesome. Sorry, David. Yeah. Well, I can sense that the word's becoming more alive and living other than just ink on paper. And you become that living epistle as John told us to become, you know. And that's that's what I'm sensing from you, That no matter where we come from, what we've done when we come to Christ and you really come to him and you surrender to him then his presence in that word comes alive. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that is why it's so imperative too that, that, that you keep in focus the main thing that the purpose in there. Always keep in mind that the knowledge of the scripture is secondary to, to intimacy with him. Okay? They go kind of hand in hand. But knowledge of Scripture without the intimacy will only just give you a mental ascension. Yeah, it just it'll just give you a knowledge of the Scripture, but it won't become part of it. It'll just be something that you know, and then something that you and then because you know you, you you're hungry for Him, you want to know Him more. You want to and so so you, then it'll become something that you are aspiring to rather than something that you have become through transformation. That's why it's so important. That's why that it is the first part, and it and it never goes away. It, it, that that being with the Father all the time, each time that y'all are together, and and then you should be doing it all, every day. That yeah. that should be an everyday thing for you, because it's 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 one thing to, for example, in Romans. I mean, that's where you guys are at. To know it's it, to see in the scripture that you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Jesus. It's one thing to know that, to see that in the scripture, and believe and say, okay, it's true because God said it, right? It's another thing to take that and going into prayer with Him and being in His presence and Him bringing that truth into you. That truth is now transformed into you. Your view of yourself suddenly shifts now mm -hmm. and you're no longer looking at yourself I'm trying to be righteous and suddenly that you're my father thank you mm -hmm. I am righteous it is because of you I don't need none of this stuff you know I'm not trying to do better you have made me better mm -hmm. and, and it becomes something else it becomes a huge revelation mm -hmm. so that's why people talk about revelation so often and what they're doing is, is that they're they're wanting revelation, but they don't understand how true revelation takes place. Which revelation is a part of transformation. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you think about the core word of it, reveal. Mm -hmm. He is revealing the truth of his word in you while you're with me. In fact, uh, after our conversation, me, me, you, and Jared had the other day, um, on the way home, the enemy started uh, attacking me. So you're, you're, well, this just goes to show you're not transformed. This just goes to show you're not transformed. And I got in the house, got along with the, with the Father, and started praying about it. And and I've learned how, I'm, or I'm learning how He communicates with me directly. And that is through understanding. He, he put the understanding on me that I am I am transformed, but I'm learning how to walk in that transformation. That's it. That's why it's so important. Show, show her how that balances that that cup of balance in between the two. There, you can just sit up there on the top. Between the two, no, between. There, there you go. It just sit flat right there. That way you don't have to get stuck. That's okay. Yeah. I sit here watching and I'm thinking, oh, Tammy, Tammy's trying to get it loose. Tammy's I held it over there. So I was expecting to see a more. stream of coffee. <laughs> I started to do it beside her and I thought, I was thinking third degree burn, so I brought it up here. That is why I talked about, I believe it's, is it 2 John 4? 
And maybe first John. First John. <clears throat> chapter 4. That, and this is what the apostle is testifying to the church, and, and but it's a, it is also teaching the church. We have come to know and believe his love. So you're talking about someone who walked with Jesus had to come to know and believe his love. In order to believe that he loves you, you've got to believe he can be loves. Yes. Like and you can't learn that unless you become mm -hmm. transformed. You learn that your Father in Heaven loves you. Our Father loves us so much but to say that doesn't ring true. It doesn't ring true. It's just a mental thing. When you're with him, he reveals his love to you, how much he loves you, and he changes you in that love, in that transformation, so that you come to believe it. And not only that, he changes your, your entire perspective about you. You start to see yourself, which is a prayer that I, I pray, that I see myself the way he sees me. Because Tammy and I were talking about this morning, we have a tendency to see ourselves simply from our faults, from our ways of fault, you know, yeah. of missing it, yeah. of all of our bumps and bruises. And we that's what we see ourselves as. And the world's taught us that that's, that's, I don't know, that's humility or that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they that's the that that other man is you're a narcissist and you don't. But it is important to be transparent, as we were talking about a while ago, because, like, I've learned, I've learned far more in the jail ministry than I've taught in the jail ministry, I'll tell you that, that I sure don't see myself put together. If you know me, you know I don't see myself put together. But I go in the jail, and they see me as put together. Mm -hmm. And I have one woman tell me one time, yeah, but we can't be like you. And I'm like... You're not supposed to be like me. You're supposed to be like Jesus. And I said, but you can't compare your Saturday night to my Sunday morning. I said, a lot of people see that as hypocritical. I said, that's really manners. We look nice. We act nice. Because we are at church. We are supposed to be behaved. I said, now you see me at the ball game. I'm hollering and screaming and having a big time like that. I said, it's not two different people. It's not two-faced. There's a difference in minding your manners and being two-faced. And, and as Southern people know about minding your manners. Um, but I, we need to be vulnerable enough to let people know that they don't have to be perfect to be Christian. Mm -hmm. So when I work with kids or I go in the jail or whatever, sometimes I'll use myself as an example where I really missed it this week. Well, I really missed it. Y'all, I'll hide it from them. I tell them exactly what I did, raw and ugly. And I say, and then I try to walk around and I hear the Lord going, you better than that. You know not to act like that. I said, so I have to turn around. I said, not condemnation, not you worthless thing. You're no good. I said, that ain't God. Mm -hmm. That one, you just feel like, oh, I'm so, I just, I know better. I know better. I show them what I did. I tell them. I, I make apologies as necessary. I tell the Lord I'm sorry. And then I just start acting better. There's no great penance or thing I need to do. Just act right. Just do better from now on. It is. Now, I will say this. this and and it's, it goes along with something Mandy was just saying. This is, this is the... The lying doctrine that has been taught in the church. And it's been taught under the disguise of humility mm -hmm. and being humble. <coughs> that you as a Christian cannot <coughs> grow in Christ to the point that you cease to sin. You say that in the church, but the scriptures support that. It's written in, from the standpoint if you sin, if you do. if not word. when you sin, or you and Paul you, didn't write to you, you, you lying, dirty, ready to sin at any moment. People, he said, I write to the saints in Colossae or you know, Ephesus. He's, he's not he's not saying it in the sense that I know you're about to go out of sin. And see, that's the attitude that is typically in the church today that we 
that the enemy has suffered the church into believing is, is humility. It's not. It really yeah. is a form it. of pride. Yes, it is. It's, it's not actually humility. It's a false humility. And, and you'll hear them like that. I mean, if you say what I just said to a, some of these, I mean, even pastors in some of these it, it, you know, places and churches that you see like that, they will try to, they'll correct you and you'll go, oh, we all sin. You may be even sinning right now. You don't even know. You ain't uh, sinning, not no way. I know. Sin is always will. That, that's, that's, Anytime somebody says that you accidentally sinned, no, that's called a mistake. That's not a, that's that's not mistake. a sin. Yeah, if you mistake. committed a sin and didn't know it, you didn't commit a sin. <clears throat> what you did may be a sin, but you didn't do it in your right. heart. Right. It was a mistake. You didn't know what it was. A sin is yeah. always yeah. willful. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. always an It's act always of something you know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it. Like that's they all. Don't know. That's that's they don't know. That's ignorance. They don't know. That's ignorance. But see, the thing is, though, is that the attitude of the church has always been, again, it's that victimization. See, you've got to understand something. You've got to see it for what it is. Mm. You know, when I say that, that I say this often. The church has not been transformed. It has conformed to the things of this world. Mm -hmm. They've been converted. That is a converted. thing of this world. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And victimization sells. Yes, it does. That is what, and the church utilizes it. If I can, all, if I can always keep you believing that you're broken, that you you're always broken. in need, and if you just keep coming back to the church assembly, eventually you're like, you know, you're going to stumble upon the combination, that elusive thing that's really just going to click and bring it all together, so it all works for you. Suddenly your life just pans out. You're receiving all the blessings. All the things start to straighten out in your life, and 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 all the sickness is gone, and 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 everything. That's what they teach. And they do it without actually saying that. Because what they teach is victimization. They teach from a standpoint. And you see this often, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that every church assembly does this. But I've seen this, especially in denominational churches. Is that they, they will teach from the standpoint that you're broken. That's their sermons are all from that standpoint that the saints are messed up and broken. That you're needing to change, you're needing something. Some will even teach that to the point that they're in a room full of saints of 25 people. They know that 25 people in there are born again Christians and they'll preach the salvation message to them. And if you don't come to the altar to get saved all over again, they get, up, they get offended because they think that you're denying the fact that you need to be saved. I mean, really, that is what does. I mean, I personally have seen that. Yeah. But, you know, I was reading, you know, where you told us to read about there, uh, Romans 5 through 8. And when you get, you know, you get to that seventh chapter and the thing starts coming out, you know, the old religious thing about Paul wanting to do what was right, but he couldn't do it. We were talking about that this week. Us <laughs> too. <laughs> and... You know, oh, who's going to rescue me from this? He was saying, in my own power, by my own self, my own efforts, I cannot stop the sin principle within me. Yes. He says, oh, but thank God, I've already been delivered from it through Christ Jesus. And I love the Baptists, but God Almighty, they beat that thing. I mean, they teach that as much. If you're not sinning by commission, you're sinning by omission. omission. Yes. What's omission? Yes. They <laughs> but see, the, the fact of the matter is, is that they've misunderstood that whole verse, that whole set That verses. whole five through eight. They it's not saying you're always going to be going around sinning. No, it doesn't. It's saying that if you're not transformed by him, then you're going to be basically trying to do, do this, this and accomplish yourself. this on your yes. own. And I can't accomplish this on my no. own. I can't stop myself from doing the things that I ought not do. But by His power, me being transformed into love, He's the one that saves me from this body of flesh. When you stop being that, what is that, sin conscious, and you start being 
Exactly. You start being righteousness conscious. So do you, are you seeing how these things come together now? The, the whole understanding, the whole, whenever it starts to click, the whole understand, you start to see that the whole understanding of, of transformation has been lost in the church. They know absolutely nothing about it. They don't. They, they, we'll say it. We'll say it when we quote certain verses. Yes. But the understanding of the fact of what it is to be transformed has is gone. It's all, and that's why you hear me say constantly, most every single Sunday, if, when you listen to some sermon, in, in most, and I'll say most because I believe I'm 100% correct on this, in most places, in most church assemblies across the United States, you hear a pseudo-psychology sermon with a spiritual twist to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And basically all it is is a worldly psychology about here's your problem, let's examine your problem, you need to do better than this, we need to work harder at this right here, let's look at being kind. You need to work on being kind because kindness is godly. And you see that it's in check. Here's where the spiritual twist goes in. It's in 1 Corinthians 13. And it says that love is patient. Love is kind. Oh. We go and we work on kindness now. So you need to work hard on kindness. And again, we give the, uh, you know, three, four stories, you know, several stories of the times that I had the opportunity to be kind and I didn't take that kind of time, you know, to be kind. And I should have. And then what it did was it messed up my, the example of my walk in Christ when they saw this. So we got to work better, be better at doing this right here. Do, do you see how that sounds like a sermon on Sunday? Yeah, motivational speaking. It is. And, and But the reality is, is that that's not what he's saying at all in that. He's saying mm -hmm. you need to be transformed in the love. Period. You need to be transformed because this is who's in you already. The way that this becomes effectual in your life is that you become this. And in becoming this, this comes out of you naturally without you attempting to try to be kind you just kind because God is in you. He is love. You become love, and love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't seek its own. All well, these things then start to pour out of you because of what you've been transformed into. That's where we've lost it. But see, that kind of stuff, that see, what I was just talking about, that pseudo-psychology thing, that is teaching victimhood. Is teaching you, and when I say victimhood, victimhood is more is not always about there's somebody beating you up. It is about you're here, you should be here. You got we're gonna come here and talk about how bad you're missing it, and you're gonna have to get there, you know, work on getting where you should be. You gotta work that's pseudo-psychology. And we put a spiritual twist to it, so we say it's God. You know, that must be God. Because it sounds really spiritual. They threw a scripture out. Yes, they threw a scripture out. Out of context. Mm -hmm. To try to make it fit what they're talking about. Yes. Well, let's look at that. That's, See, a, that's yeah. a good thing. And before we go into a, a scripture that I wanted us to kind of study on. Listen. That's actually, this, is, this is something that the Holy Spirit drove home me the other day. I was listening to, uh -oh. or, or read something uh, on a online uh, post. And a guy posted this. Oh, it was uh, Psalms 119, verse 133. Now, he was a pastor. Hmm? 119. One, chapter uh, 119, verse 133. Now, the guy that posted this was a pastor, and it was to up, be uplifting to the body of Christ, okay? Now, this is why it's so imperative to reason Scripture and weigh Scripture, okay? Now, somebody read 133 to me. Make my steps steady through your promise. Don't let any sin dominate me. 
and the church would go, Amen. Right? Yeah. Let me read it a, loud, a little bit louder here so that anybody on the song line didn't get it. You're great. No. No. Keep steady my steps according to your promise and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Sounds really great, right? Mm -hmm. Does not even apply to us in the New Covenant. This is David talking and he's asking God to keep his steps going according to, his, to, to the Lord's promises, right? And he says, don't let the iniquity of sin have dominion over me. Well, what, let's go over to Romans 6. And let's start in, in, in verse 12. Who wants to read that all the way through 14? I do. Go ahead. Sin then. is a dethroned monarch, so you must no longer give it an opportunity to rule over your life, controlling your life and compelling you to obey its desires and cravings. So then refuse to answer its call to surrender your body as a tool for wickedness. Instead, Passionately answer God's call to keep yielding your body to Him as one who has now experienced resurrection life. You live now for His pleasure, ready to be used for His noble purpose. Remember this, sin will not conquer you, for God already has. You are not governed by law, but governed by the reign of the grace of God. Ooh. What translation? Passion. Passion translation. Yeah. Here, you want me to read it? Yeah, go um, ahead. <laughs> Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires, and do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourself to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under law but under grace. Read 14 again. Read it again. I wouldn't ask for all that. Hold on. For sin will not Thank rule you. over you because you are not under the law but under grace. Oh, well, so, Thank you. so how did that... I didn't, he didn't scroll. So how, how does that fit with Psalms 119.33? Well, they were under the law, we're under the grace. So it's right. Not so, the same. so get get no. See, I, I, I'm I'm wanting to, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here on discerning the scriptures. Yep. What is for us that is spiritual and for us and how we're to live versus what is not? Okay. So the point that I'm trying to make is now under a new covenant. That is not something that you live by in verse 133. Mm -hmm. Because, see, he's asking God not to let it be sin to have dominion over him. Because as, as us being born again, sin does not have dominion over him. There you go. You yes. see the difference. It's Watch it. It even says it in, in the same thing. If you go Psalms 19... Verse 13. I'll read this so y'all have to flip over there. But he says, keep back. This is David again. Praying to God. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. So once again, he's asking God, please don't let sin have, have his way over me. But in Romans 6, he said, for sin will not have dominion over you. Not try not to have it over it. It will not. Because of what? You are not under the law, but you're under grace. So something is different, right? So now under the new law, both of those things cannot be true anymore. What was written in Psalms was true at the time that it was written when he was under the law. But now under the new covenant, it does not apply anymore. 
It cannot. So if that's the case, now see, this is what I'm talking about, about discerning the scriptures. Both of those now, under the new law, under the new covenant, cannot be true. You see that? That's how you have to come to understand the word. When you see something like this, when when you see someone write something, because see, I, this is a warning to the church in general to pay attention. The guy that wrote this, I have no doubt in my mind that he meant that well. Mm -hmm. He meant that, that this would be something to be an uplifting thing, right? He was dead wrong, though, in what he wrote, because what he did was is he took people now who are under righteousness, who are under grace, and he gave them a spiritual thing that was, uh, that was true under the old law that does not apply now. Now, if you're not aware of that, then you would suck that in, take that in, and believe what you just read. Yeah. And it would affect your life because now you're thinking, I need to pray to God that all these things that are going on around me do not affect me. I got to, oh God, there are so many demonic people and demons on this airplane. Please don't let them overtake me whenever I get on the airplane. I'm being facetious out there. Okay, just so you don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and You ain't wrong, though, because I've heard people talk like that. Yes. Preachers talk like that. Right. But see, the fact of the matter is, is that that is living out something that is not true anymore. Okay? It was true at one time. Now you have a new and better covenant. Now we live under grace, under the authority of Jesus Christ. So now sin has no dominion over us. Well, you know, that's part of the problem is it sounds good, yes. They make good sermons to bring Torah into grace. And they're two opposite ends of different sticks. Mm -hmm. They're not the same stick. You know, the old law was its rules and regulations. All it took was one man to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And he fulfilled it. Because if he didn't, he's got to come back and do it. Under <coughs> the law of grace, it's all done. <clears throat> it's all took care of. You know, the sin issue is solved. Because mm -hmm. sin's going to tell you how how such a low worm you are, how unworthy you are, and all that. That's been dealt with, and either Jesus' blood and His sacrifice for me was either enough for me to change and get my living and thinking in line with His Word, or else we're lost. Right. Absolutely lost. Well, see, this is what the reason that I'm I'm bringing this up. It's, it's not because I'm wanting to sit here and go, look how bad people are missing it, okay? The point is, is this. Every believer should be well-versed enough in the scriptures, for one, that whenever they hear something, that they're weighing this. They're weighing what, what I'm hearing based off of what I know in, in, in the new covenant, what, what it is that I know. Because I want to tell you something. Any time, I watch this, and, and, and really, it, you see this, okay? Do, do we all mm -hmm. understand there is a division? There is a new, co oh, new covenant, and there was an old, old covenant, covenant, right? Mm -hmm. Old meaning it's gone. <clears throat> it's passed away, right? You understand that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? Anything that was a spiritual concept that actually continues, you find it repeated at some manner, in the new. Yes. If it's not, it doesn't apply. Okay? Because it's a new covenant. That's what we live by, right? You will always find it. You, whether it's an intentional thing or whether it's an unintentional thing, you will always find the manipulation, a spiritual manipulation 
you will see people go back into the, the old, old covenant. covenant. Low hanging fruit. Tithing. Tithing is not in the new covenant. No. It isn't. It Sorry. Is. There is no such thing as not tithing and offerings. That is a lie. Whoever come up with that, it was a lie. There is only giving in the new covenant. And you're to give as you have purpose in your heart because yeah. God was a cheerful giver. He does not, he said, don't do it by compulsion. Everything in the Old Testament was compulsive. Was compulsive. Yeah. The giving that whenever we immediately start to try to do this, see, you watch. When a pastor wants to start talking about tithing, he will go right back to Malachi. You will be cursed with a curse. Would, okay, well, let's take this into the new covenant. Jesus became a curse and did so that we would never be cursed. We're redeemed. Okay, so let's reason this out. God, who became a curse for us so that we would be free from not only the curse but the old law and everything, okay? Now suddenly he's going to flip back and he's going to curse us. Right? Sounds like Does that make amazing. sense to anyone? No. No. But we, you'll see that used. Yeah. I've see, seen it, I've seen it with prayer too. It's about mm -hmm. like women covering their head when they pray, mm -hmm. and I've seen that too. Well, well, you know, women are supposed to cover their hair with head that when they pray. And once again, old covenant. And actually, with the tithing thing, I used to be under that. Like, okay, okay, yeah. we got to do the math. We got to get our calculator out and make sure we're giving our ten percent, or I know what God's going to do to us. And now that we're free from that, and you did a sermon on that, I don't mm -hmm. even know when. Our part of the part of your sermon was on the tithing, and it was just like like the light bulb went off. And it actually talking about that freedom. It freed me to actually be able to give more at times. And then maybe there were times well, I couldn't give as much because I wasn't. We weren't. You take out that calculator every month and going, mm -hmm. okay, how much can we give? Okay, it's got to be two dollars, two cents, mm -hmm. and and a half. Yeah, you know, and a pence. So, you know, and it really freed us up to be able, and, like, and freed our hearts up that we weren't being condemned on yeah. what we were given. We weren't being condemned on, you know, all this other stuff, too. Yeah. Well, that's what we were going to say. I've had to, I have to pay my tithe. Have no, pay. that's a business mm -hmm. deal. That's not a covenant. Yeah. One we're, great example, Casey, when, when we were still, when we all went to First Assembly, Casey would pray on the way to church. I mean, he prayed during the week, but every week he would stop at uh, right there at the church at the State Employees Credit Union and draw out what the Lord told him to give. And um, he did this every week, and he gave every week whatever the Lord told him to. And sometimes the Lord would tell him a number, Casey would be like, you sure? Did I hear that right? And anyway, one Sunday he was coming to church, and he was praying about it, and the Lord said, don't stop at the bank. And he's like, well, I gotta get, I gotta get my get my offering. He's like, don't stop at the bank. That's what he kept hearing. Keep on going. So he came to church, and I was sitting there in the little area where you have coffee or whatever before oh, you yeah, go to little, church. Yeah. And there was a girl in there. Her husband had, her ex husband had come to church, and he was an abuser, and had her scared to death. And I felt like Scott needed to drop me off at that door. And there she sat. I didn't go in that door. I went in another door. Casey felt like he needed to come in the door, and he came in while Scott was parking and came in there. She needed protecting. First Assembly didn't need his money. She needed protecting. God sent us to where she was. Mm -hmm. So, obeying and cheerful. Yeah. See, that used to be what I never quite could reconcile in my mind. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile, don't give under compulsion, be a cheerful giver, but I'm going to be told that I have to be you given have to. Uh, what ten, you know, whatever it is uh, of my paycheck, gross paycheck. Yeah, you want make net, sure that they tell you the gross. Do you want a net return or do you want a gross return yes. on your giving? She's telling you. I'm telling you. Yeah, this is stuff. That. This is that. spiritual yeah. manipulation. We've heard that. Yes. Well, if you want a gross blessing, give off a gross back. Exactly. You want a net. Blessing, give up. Yeah, and see, this this is the lie. See, so do you see how we do how this has been done, and and we accept that this is being okay. He gave 
Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. liberty. There is freedom. There is emancipation. From he is anything. the one that brings freedom to us. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that he's putting us back in chains? He frees us from chains, now he's going to put us back in chains again. This doesn't make sense. And it's not just that. I mean, the, the low-hanging is tithing is a low-hanging fruit. You know, because it's easy. That's It's done on a regular basis. But you see it on a regular basis. I watch them all the time. People manipulate and go back into the old covenant and pull out something out of context, try to slap it on now to the new belief, to the believer in the new covenant and put them back in chains again. That's trying to put wine in an old wine skin. Yeah. Your Lord just gave me something about blue my lips off. I about said it in the middle of you talking. If you are giving, tithing, offering, whatever, for a return, you are not giving. No, you are no. loaning. God does loaning. not need to borrow Ooh. your money. Oh, oh Lord. That's a good one. Oh, Sorry. That's a good one. I like that. But see, that, that right there, again, <laughs> again, this goes back to the heart of the people that are in the prosperity the gospel heart. message. They're coming to God for what they can get. They're giving to God for what Thank multiple you. returns. It's just what Tammy said. God, that was good. It they are loaning to God <laughs> with interest. Mm -hmm. Yes. They're and getting, expect they, and really what they're they doing are, is that they're that giving and they're, they're trying to get the biggest interest of return that they can get. Yes, they are. Loan charts. They want the tenfold return. Yeah, hundred. Hundred fold return. return. Yeah. You never look at it like that, but yeah, they're spiritual loan charts. Mm -hmm. You see that? That is one of the reasons why the Lord told me one uh, has told me before, and it and it doesn't just apply to the thing that He was telling me at the time. I was praying for an assembly, and I was going on and on, you know, different times about because there was a wolf in the pulpit, and I'm like, I'm very upset. The fact is that these people are there, good people, people I love that I've been to, in, in to the, you know, that I have been with. And I prayed, and I would pray every so often. It would just come back to me, and I'd pray for them again. And one day the Lord said, stop. He said, they're not going in there blind. They know what they're getting, and they're choosing it anyway. So in other words, they were getting what they were wanting. Yeah. So stop praying for them. And when he did, I realized that, that, that we do that on a lot of other stuff. The people that are coming to, that, that are, are wrapped up in some of these things like prosperity gospel. Don't get me wrong. People be on, on, online don't get bent out of shape. There is a prosperity in God. Yes, there That's is. not our focus. No. If your idea is focusing on the blessings of God all the time, you aren't doing things for God. You're doing things for what you can get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're chasing after blessings where you shouldn't be. And I even hear people even have ministries and they talk about that. Chase after the blessings because they're ours. That's not why you're His. You're saved for His great name. Yes, like any good father, oh, He has given to us and He is prospering us and He's given us money and He's taking care of us. That's not where your focus is supposed to be. No. Nope. If he's giving you extra stuff, it's so you can bless others. Amen. That's it. Amen. And he right. will not if you do sense. not. That is why it <laughs> turns into a pyramid scheme with, yeah. with the prosperity gospel. Y'all know what a pyramid scheme is, don't you? Yeah. 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 So you got one money. guy at the top. Back. He's getting all the money. And then everything trickles up. He's the one riding around with a, with a new Mercedes and all kinds of stuff like that and talking to everybody. Look how this is all working for me. If you'll just keep giving, you'll God's going to bless you for that right there. It's the same kind of stuff that I am way. It's the same kind of stuff of all these other types of, of pyramid schemes do. The people at the top make all the money. You ain't on the top of the pile, you ain't making no money. And see, this was how that was also was done. That guy that got and the reason I'm mentioning it, you know, from a prosperity gospel mm -hmm. standpoint, is because they are one of the primary ways of abusing tithing. Because they will go back and talk about tithing that way. Mm -hmm. And it used to be one of the churches I went to was the Word of Faith Church. They are prosperity gospel church. And 
the what they would do, and I promise you this, this this happened. This happened to me. You got two hundred dollars left out of your paycheck. Your power bill gonna be cut off on Monday. It's Sunday. You can either pay your, pay your bill, bill, which will be the whole two hundred dollars, or you can give your tithe. And sit in the dark. And well, <laughs> you ask the you ask the ones that's in leadership, <laughs> and what they tell you is, well, if you give your money. God will make sure that your bill is paid. And then Sunday, Monday, you're sitting in the dark. Not cheerful at all. No. <laughs> it is an abuse. <laughs> it only went more again into their own pocket, to, into their church. Now, understand something. There are some people that hold to that belief that, that they, they are deceived. Remember I told you before that the greatest deception that there is is self-deception. Yes. They are absolutely self-deceived. They believe wholeheartedly what they're doing because they're only looking at it from the standpoint that they're getting money because they're the one at the top. So they think this stuff is working for them when really you're, they're fleecing the flock. Yeah, well, they're skinning the flock. And what they're doing is, is that they're getting all these people that are coming there this is where, again, this is when the Lord you know, goes along with what he told me to stop praying for. He said, they are like-minded. They know what they're going to get. That's, that's a sad state to be in where the Lord says, stop it. This is what they've set their heart to. It's not on me. It's on what I will do for them, what I will give them. And see, the church has got, and see, it's not just about money that this happens. This happens on, on most every kind of topic that you can think about in the scriptures. And they, and people who have, who are basically con men that are in the pulpit. I actually heard a man, uh, or uh, actually I think I posted the quote from him made a comment and said that the most dangerous thing to the church in the United States is the pulpit. Because what we've gotten in the absence of discipleship and the church growing up in, and being transformed so that whenever they look at the Word of God and study the Word of God and become the Word, become love, just as He's loved, and be able to listen to something and someone say something and the Holy Spirit have a platform to be able to say, that's wrong. That's not right. What they're saying. That's why I tell Timmy about red flags. It's like when, you, when, when he shows it to you, they ain't no one showing it. True. You, you can't sit there and go, I'm going to tell you right now, this goes for you. You can't turn the Holy Spirit off on that stuff. I go somewhere and I listen to something and I can go with every intent that I am going to just worship and have a good time and all of a sudden they say something that ain't right and it's like lights going ah, 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 with sirens. <laughs> and you're like, what? But then his hand starts doing that right there. What? I, yes, yes, we've been married too yes, long yes, because yes. she knows my little telltale things. When he's doing this right here with his hand, mm -hmm. he's having a conversation. She does. She, and she'll get me. She'll go, what conversation are you having in your head at this moment? <laughs> that's, that's interesting. There's a, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. Saying. She'll get me. She got me when I said it and, and won it. And, and recently, shall Yeah, recently. And I'm sitting there going, and I'm trying not okay. to say nothing because she wanted to truly just have a good time worshiping. And I'm going... I am going to keep this to myself. I am going to keep this <laughs> to like, myself. What? That what hand just go. That is what she did. She did. She did. That's how she looked at me. Wow. She first she said, "What? Is, what? What's going on? Are you mad?" I went, "No, nope. I'm fine." Now we're going to be. Good I, I'm, I'm fine. And, and a little bit later, she goes, "What is yeah. it?" You know? I, mean, I can work with the VAU on criminal minds. I, I I notice what people do. I do not listen to what people say. The body language, huh? Right. I'm listening to this. Listen, 
And, and it's not just that one. I mean, it's it's like a lot of stuff. I mean, there, there's I could almost and, and this is what I told Casey whenever she, he first came to Christ, because there's like this myriad of, of, of things on television to watch. On television, you know, yeah. like uh, people preaching. Or go to YouTube, and there's just like this huge oh, right. thing of people to watch. And it was like, well, who do you listen to? You know, and and. Most anybody that's new to Christ is going to do that because they're going to come with the attitude and the mindset that, well, they're all Christians, right? Yeah, right. And so they're all going, they're all on the same team, and they're all preaching truth. Well, lucky for them, we all got the same textbook. Study it yourself. You would think so, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I told Tammy before. Sometimes I miss being a child in church. Where you think that everybody is good, everybody's a Christian, everybody's on the same team, everybody that gets yes. steps up into the pulpit are preaching because they are preaching the truth of God's word and they love God and they love you. And then you grow up and you find out that wasn't even remotely true. And we all have that exact defining moment that we realize that was not the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we I have think our, everybody knows that. Yeah. For we you, have our epiphanies. Your own exact moment that you learn. Yeah. And it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. But the fact is, is that the unity in Christ should be that we are all out of the Scriptures. The Scripture says what it says. We've been transformed into love. We have a unity in the body because we love one another. Listen, you can't have unity in the church. Absent of being transformed into love, and it's all of us going, this is true. I'm not going to read into it what I want to believe. I'm going to let the Scriptures say what it says and believe it. The Scriptures isn't what needs to be changed. I do. Amen to that. Okay? So, that is where... See, that will bring unity. That will bring unity in the church. What it will not do to bring... What will not bring unity is... Well, we all just need to be nice and get along. That has happens to be the most prevalent idea of unity. I'm accepting of you and you're I'm accepting of you and you're accepting of me. And yeah, we have our nuances that we don't believe exactly the same in the scripture. But if we believe Jesus is Lord, we can all be in unity. No, it does not say that. No. It says that we are to be unified in the truth. The truth is the Word of God. Him. Period. Everything He taught, everything He said, and everything He did. That's the truth. You don't get a hodgepodge of things and go, Oh, I believe Jesus did this and died on the cross for me, but all these other things that He said... Oh no, no. Well, I don't really feel like that. That doesn't. That makes me uncomfortable. You're not worshiping the God of the Bible. You're worshiping you. You have created a God after your own image, named it Jesus. He acts and looks just like you, but you still want to call yourself a Christian, so you name him Jesus. That's what a lot of people do. Why do you think there's going to be a time whenever Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you? These people thought they were Christians. But they never had been born again. They had never received Him. They had never been transformed. You don't get the option of picking the parts that feel good to your flesh and be a Christian. And deny the rest of them. True. I get. I have people that get bent out of shape online because I will call them an unbeliever, even though they say I'm a Christian. But they'll go around and they'll say, "Well, the power of God doesn't operate. You can't do that. You can't speak in tongues. Oh, it was other languages, but only for Acts two. All these things that does not say in the scriptures." I just point them back to Mark sixteen. These are the signs that will follow those that believe. believe. So, the opposite is true. 
So if you're not believing them, those signs won't follow you. You won't see them. You'll deny them. But the catalyst of the whole thing is what you are. You do not believe. So that makes you an unbeliever. Yeah, if you don't believe, you're an unbeliever. Like it or not. I don't care yeah. what title you tack on yourself. You can call yourself a Christian. Put it on your tombstone. It don't make you one. And I grew up um, in the. I grew up in a church that didn't believe in the works and stuff like that. Or not works, but the power, power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit and stuff like that. And uh, one of the one of the main things I can remember when uh, Casey and Jericho were mentoring us is, you know, he always took it back to scripture and talk about that. You know, it, this is what follows those that believe. And I was like, well, I can't, I could never argue with him. And man, I wanted to at times. <laughs> and, but, I mean, because he always took it back to Scripture. Yeah. And then I went to Scripture, and I read it and was like, well, it's here. I can't, you know. And then I'm like, okay. And, and I know <coughs> Lee was real quick to, like, go, yeah, I'm, I'm embracing this. But every time we met, yeah, I know he was like, all right, Randy, what's the question? You know, or what's the comment? What you got to say? Because he could see it on my face. But then, like I said, he, I, I love that he always took it back to Scripture. And then, I, then I could go back and go, okay, let me study this. Okay, Lord. And, and, and really and truly pray, okay, Lord, I really want to understand this. You know, put aside the flesh. What, what do you say? And then being able to understand it, to embrace it, and then actually be able to act on it. The Her thing that awesome. you had, though, was a heart that I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And it don't, it don't sit right because all I've learned before. Mm -hmm. But the word's right. Yeah. The word's right. Yes. Once the you decide right, that, no it might what. feel weird, it might mm -hmm. sound weird, <clears throat> but if anything, that word ain't going to just. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be you. Mm -hmm. and he that change is painful. Yeah, he never said, because I said it. He never mm -hmm. said, because Jericho said it. He never said, because Pastor Scott told me. Mm -hmm. He said, here it is. Let's go to Scripture. Let's read it. Let's read it in context. Let's understand it. Now, what questions? You know, now, what questions do you have? Like, I love that. that he yeah. always took it back to Jesus. Yeah. Well, see, that again, that is laying down our own biases. A bias is, 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 can be a, anything. It can be mm -hmm. a, from a doctrine that you learned in church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the difficult part is, is that you're still trying to hang on to that bias and make the word be reconciled through this bias. And every believer has to do the same thing. You have to lay down all your preconceived notions and biases. And yeah. let the word say what it says. Yep. Read it in That's context. That's what we're talking word. about, you know, this, this, this whole thing about discerning the word. Take it into the scripture. Go in there and in context, read what is being said. Look at the covenants that you're in. Mm -hmm. Look at what the scripture says. Just like this. It, the first thing that the Lord showed me in order to be able to tear that down when it comes to tithing. He showed me. Okay, well, here's what it says in, in the new covenant. You need to be a cheerful giver. You need to be not give out a compulsion. And then in the old covenant, but in the old covenant, it is by compulsion. You're going to be cursed. That's pretty big compulsion. That's a pretty good Okay, so how and, and the thing is, is that when you're compuls in compulsion, you can't be a cheerful giver because somebody's forcing you to give money. That's like a loan shark coming to get your money. You yeah, yeah. He's going to go. I'm going to break your hand today if you do not give me the money. Mm -hmm. That's compulsion. The one I knew you should shoot you in the kneecap. <laughs> <laughs> but you think about it. Those two can't both be true now. See, that's what the, what the, what we have to do as, as believers, as scriptural people, is to go in there and weigh it. That's what the Bereans did. Take what you're saying, what you're hearing, and you're weighing it. What does it say? Go into the Word of God and weigh what is being said. When you get to a contradiction in the Scripture... There can't, or what you perceive to be a contradiction, both cannot be true. One is not is going to be incorrect, or both, but one can't. Both of them can't be true. 
That's what we have to do. That's why we have to be real careful. See, that, that was one of the things, like, whenever Tammy and I went uh, to this certain place, and, and they were teaching all this stuff that was not right, and she says, are you going to give any money? I'm like, no. You be careful where you give your money. Because that is your stamp of approval. That is yes, your support is. of what is being taught. And if error is being taught and you give your money to it, you're putting your stamp of approval on stuff that is not true and helping them continue to perpetuate what is not true anymore. But that's when you did that. That spoke to my pride. I don't think me and you ever discussed that, but it spoke to my pride because I'm going to put something in there when it comes by because everybody's looking. Yeah. And that's no reason to do that. That's, mm -hmm. But I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so, you know, I was like, well, what are people going to think we don't put something in there? Yeah. And I was like, I'm yeah. more concerned about what Jesus thinks. Yes. <laughs> and we have to, see, the church has to get back to doing that. We got, listen, it's kind of along the same lines as this. Whenever Casey was my associate pastor, whenever we were, we had the big assembly together. We were careful about who we would allow to speak. Mm -hmm. We're not just going to allow somebody from the outside that's going to come in and speak just because they've got some notoriety. Yeah. Because if they say something in the pulpit, the people that are listening are already under the assumption that this person must be right as rain because Pastor Scott and Pastor Casey has already said, yes, it's good for them to be able to stand up here and I'm giving them a mic to be able to speak about what is being yeah. said. So it is giving our stamp of approval on it. So all of you would have heard it and thought, well, this is true then because Pastor Scott and Pastor Casey is okay with it. But surely they would have paid attention to the things that this person was going to be preaching about and wouldn't allow them in there. Then other places would have done the same, could have done, the, would have done the same thing. They would have went, oh, well, Scott and Casey are okay with this person over here, so we'll, we'll invite them to come over here and preach. You see how that, how how false teaching multiplies on that? Because preaching, I heard sowing, like the sowing, planting those seeds, and then they just grow, planting those lives. Yes, grow. yes. That's why you've got to be careful because false teaching multiplies too. Lies. Build a foundation and build upon it on that foundation if you allow it to stay. That's why Jesus talked about it in the form of leaven. Paul, same thing, in the form of leaven. Because you can't take it out. It's, that does away with that whole thing of eat the meat and spit out the bones. I, that line doctrine ate at me from the moment that I, first time I ever heard it, I believe, or at least let, sometime in there. But the fact of the matter is, you're never told to eat the meat and spit out the bones. Matter of fact, if there's bones in it, Jesus said, throw the whole thing out. Yeah. Because yeah. that's all you can do with leaven. That was the whole purpose in talking about leaven in, in, in the form of false teaching. Because you can't remove leaven once it's already been added to the loaf. Mm -hmm. so, one, you have to throw the loaf. one analogy I heard is, if you, look at, if you pick up a pack of rat poison and look at it, 99 Point five percent of it is actually good food. Mm -hmm. It's that point five you got to watch out for. So you can have really good teaching, but if you have that little bit of poison slid in there, mm -hmm. that's what's going to get you. Yes, yeah. yeah. That is the tactic of Satan, and that's the church has been so blind, blind to this that we think, oh, I like that. Oh, I've known them for years. That we will use that to excuse what should not be allowed. You're never given a, told to give a place yeah. to something that is not true. He is the truth. When you start, somebody starts doing something wrong, teaching something that's wrong, creating a false doctrine, the church is the last wall to stop that. And they're supposed to. Not just being spectators. You're never called to be a spectator. You're never called to be a congregationalist. You're a saint, a son, a daughter of the Most High. 
the same Holy Spirit is in you is in every person that stands in the pulpit. It is just as much your the importance for you to make sure that what you're hearing is true as it is for the person that's standing in the pulpit that's supposed to be doing it. The church, and listen, times are not getting any better. If you think that it's like suddenly that the wolves are going, oh, we, we've exposed there's wolves in the pulpit, and suddenly they're all going to scatter. No. It's going to get worse. It's going to get so worse that it's going to be called the great falling away. Not because there is no church attendance and what the world calls church. It'll be going just as strong on Sunday, maybe even stronger. It'll be watered down and compromised truth. And the world will love it because it can come in and, and leave the same way that it came in. But those who will be preaching and teaching what is true, this will be where you'll see this kind of the truth being brought. Preach, because they won't be allowed in the others in the other and the masses don't want to hear this the masses won't have their ears tickled yeah they want to cater to their flesh they want to run in some place that's going to tell them if you if you give me a thousand dollars god's going to multiply it by 10 100 fold and they'll flock to that kind of stuff because their flesh is what's leading them. They're greedy. They're looking for a return on, on giving their life to Christ. As Tammy said, they loaned the money to God and now they're looking for their interest. Man, that, that ain't going away. That's stuck. That was the problem. But that is what's happening. It happens on don't and, and see we talk about things that are from, that are on the standpoint of just being very big right there in your face type of stuff right. Think about the more subtle things, the things that are just like they get compromised and it's just like a little blur, blurp in the discussion in passing. Daniel was with the first transgender. Hmm. Where do they get that? Satan. I don't know right. how they come I've up read with Daniel it. multiple times, but I never caught it, anything it, like it's that. It's somebody that's trying to, that, yeah, again, yeah. Satan, well, that is trying to conform, well, trying to get the church body to conform to a sin, to allow a sin. And they're given little yeah. drops and little, little pieces here and there. They'll lead you that way. Because if you can get them to consume the little piece here and there, eventually they get to a point that they become blinded to the fact of what they what the Scripture has already said. John Howard Griffin said, any fool and arrogant about a passage of Scripture to back him up. Because he takes that half a verse from John 3, 1, yep. and he goes, that, that'll that back it up. Like you said, put two verses together. What is it? So-and-so went out and killed himself. Judas, Judas went out and hung himself. himself. Do likewise. Do likewise. Do likewise. So you're putting two Scriptures that have nothing to do each other, with each other together. And then, like I said, and if I'm already with my flesh and with my worldly view wanting to read into that, I'm already going to try to find a verse and I'm going to twist it and not read it the way it's supposed yeah. to read. Yeah. Well, they but say they, because they said Daniel was made a unit. But there's no evidence that Daniel, Hananiah, Mikael, or Azariah were ever castrated. Yeah. Matter they, of fact, they were very much, they were staunch Hebrews uh -huh. following yep. the law. You do so they castrated. would not have given in to that. No. They, they would, would not, not have done it. The fact, listen, I'm going to tell you what. That's a big thing for a man to go, mm -mm. no, you ain't kept my law. No, because we sit there and we talk about it. they would not bow and pray to him, to to the his king. Image. You think that they're going to let some part of their body be cut off that would violate the law too? I mean, seriously. I mean, that's that's a, that's that goes beyond ignorance. Mm -hmm. But that, they're just pushing that to say that that justifies uh, transgender, transgender, and from transgender. Homosexuality. Yes. 
or they take a statement of something that happened and try to take it as a teaching. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the thing is, is that they read into something that isn't even there. But see, that's, that's the there. way that they do. But see, because ain't nobody gonna look it up themselves. <clears throat> that's the problem. See, this is what I'm talking yeah. about. They know that taking look it up. what is being said and go back into the Word of God. But do you know how many people that were taught that looked for an excuse? Do you know how many people contacted me in private to ask my thoughts on it? I was like, read about it. Yeah, for sure. Read it. They won't read it for themselves. What do I think about it? What do you think about it? What do you think about it? Read it. Say but what again, you, what you, say. you can go back to this. It bothered you enough to question. If somebody is discipled and transformation takes place, that would not okay. even be a ground that they could plant that seed. Yeah, that's a conversion. That is, that is, see, that's why it has been such a blow to the church that Satan has gotten out of it true biblical discipleship. It, that he, when discipleship is out of it, transformation is, becomes gone. That's removed. Because they go together. Yeah. Well, whenever the church is not being transformed, guess what? They're just being converted. Yes. And now, any old whim of doctrine that comes along, they latch on to it because it sounds spiritual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. It behooves the wolves in the pulpit to keep the church ignorant, to keep them immature. Because while they're immature and they're selling them on victimization, they keep them coming back, and they keep them under control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they got a good church, a good kids program. A good what? A kids program. Yeah, but they got a good kids program. Well, define good. I, Occupy. No, yeah. They, 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 yeah, they can take the child, and I don't have nothing to worry about Just them for the next few hours. <laughs> but the fact that, and they, they, they and the kids are are played with, and then all that. Now, there's some good. Don't get me wrong. We're not saying that. We're not saying that there aren't good children's programs and stuff. No, I love good children's program. I had four little kids. I love good children's yeah. programs that have fun and teach them and they're learning and, and growing and blah, blah, blah. I'm 1,000%. I'm going to use Maury math for that. I am 1,000% for that. But at what cost? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I used exactly. to go over Matthew's yeah. Sunday school lessons. We actually went over them and they were we extended them through the whole week. Yes. I, yes. I would talk to the Sunday school teacher prior because Matthew struggled with reading and everything. I was like, can you tell me what verses he needs to memorize? Give me, can, she would give me the Sunday school lesson the week before she was going to go over it so I could preview it mm -hmm. and we could go over it beforehand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was very much involved to make sure. Well, like I said, we're we're not opposed to no, no. children's church. Absolutely I not. Love it. But it's just like what she said. You don't do, go to a church for a children's program at the expense of truth. That's right. That, that was my point. Yes, thank you for somebody who hollers at me. <clears throat> no. Well, that could be anything. <clears throat> you know what? They have a good uh, choir. Good, a good yeah. choir. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. 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 need anything. to make sure that yeah. if they're going for a children's program, get involved in it. Make sure that it is not getting good. Involved. Yeah, but they're willing to sit under teaching that is not sound so their kids are in a good program. Yeah. Find another good program. Or you have different teachers. Yeah. Or go to a place yeah. that you have to have them in there with you. The fact is that the most important part is that you sit under truth. Mm -hmm. That's it. Because it's convenient or not. Yes, and because the fact of the matter is, is that it doesn't matter how much you may have in the beginning know that what is being said is true. When you hear something that is a lie over and over and it over becomes the and truth. over. A little more and more and more, you get to a point where you become more accepting of it to the point that you do accept it mm -hmm. because you've heard it so much. Well, yeah, that's what Hitler said. Tell a lie long enough and it becomes the truth. Isn't that scary? Mm -hmm. But see, the thing is that the church is, is blinded right now. But the only thing, and, and I mean, we've even heard people make the comment before, well, I'm standing there because I know that it's what's being taught is being taught wrong, but God's going to, is going to tear that down and even, and what's going to be built back up. I want, he told me I needed to be a part of it. No, he did not. That was yourself. What makes you think that the, the, the teaching that's in 
that's going on in that assembly is going to stop? What if it's worse? See, we get this idea that that you, that what God said it was going to be like in the end isn't really going to happen. It, it, we get we act like oh well here he's going to tear that stuff down. Maybe he's telling you you need to go someplace else. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's saying like any like a family should be that the father goes, mm -mm, I'm getting my wife no, and my on. children and we're going someplace else. We're going someplace where truth is being taught. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, some don't. They let their wife continue on going over there while they're going somewhere yes, else. Yes, and they'll do it because, well, many of them will continue to go because their wife wants to go there. Their friends are there. I, lo I, I love my wife, but if we're sitting under something that I, I, that I see is not true, we're leaving. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not going to. That's non-negotiable. Not being in something, being in something that is not true is not negotiable for for my walk in Christ. It, it, it not is, just you, but your wife and your yes, children. And yes. Yes. My question would be, your why do you think every, it's okay? Yeah. People realize they're affecting every generation after them. Yes. So and and guys. It, the, the, the thing is that we have to understand it, that the most important part is the subtle part. See, those things that are glaring. See, I've said this kind of stuff before. When Satan jumps out and, and when he's doing something, he goes, blah, I'm Satan. See, that's why Tammy did it over there at the same time. I'm Satan. Those are easy. Come with me, little girl. Yeah. Those are easy to see. Big time. It's the ones that look and sound spiritual that is the that is what does the scripture say? It's the little foxes that the little, little foxes, the little jackals, yeah, the, that the, rule the vines. Yes, that they come along and, and and they it's the little things, it's the little stuff that you accept. It's just one off. Yep, it, it's that the spiritual discerning is not the difference between right and wrong. It's between right and almost right. Mm -hmm. Just like I said, wrong is easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost mm -hmm. right. Wrong to experience blatant. and discern. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And then if you don't get the almost right, then it moves a little, another little degree, and then it moves another mm -hmm. little degree mm -hmm. until that finally micro. that that blah is now all of a sudden. Well, it ain't that bad. That, bad. that little exactly. leak yeah. becomes a flood. Or mm -hmm. we'll make we'll do this right here, and I'm sure that anybody that's been in church has heard this actually said at some point in time. Well, that's not a salvation issue. Mm -hmm. It is a salvation issue. All of it has to do with salvation. Because yeah. salvation so so is more than getting you into heaven. Mm -hmm. It's about transformation, change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like I heard one say today. That he got saved because he was afraid of going to hell. Mm -hmm. And he's and so that's self centered. He's still self centered. Mm -hmm. most of us get most, just most of us come, a lot of us come to Christ that way mm -hmm. that's why I, 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 not, you know, not always not but, always I mean, but uh, oh, that's why I don't know I'll just put myself there I mean that's how yeah. I came I came but to share trans hell transformed and yeah, but then and, but then now that you now that you have been you know now that you're in the light now you start to read the scripture mm -hmm. different in the and light. then you start to grow yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you say, and that does happen. Mm -hmm. But the most effective way to bring somebody to Christ mm -hmm. is by the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's what it says in the scriptures. It says mm -hmm. it's the goodness of God that leads mm -hmm. men to repentance. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And because and Tammy and I actually, and I'm going to end with this right here because I don't want us to go too much longer. We just keep talking and, and, and stuff. And um, I love it. I, I'm, I'm doing it for y'all's sake. Um, we saw a bunch of people standing on the corner. They were leaving Walmart yesterday, or the Walmart area. And they were sitting there with the signs, Repent or going to hell. And all this stuff, some guy with a big old Bull microphone Bull and Bull stuff, Bull you know, <laughs> screaming at people Bull about Bull. that they're going to hell and stuff, you know. And I thought to myself, I would love to ask him, how many people have actually it's come right. to Christ? Is it, is it working? 
How's that work? Yeah, that, that? yeah. How's that work? Is bars? it that you just want to stand there and scream? Because Although they're, they're right. How many people going down the road are going, oh yeah, let me I'm go going to hell. Let me, let me pull over let right now. Let me pull now. over and repent right and now. If it work, and if it's worked for people, God forgive me and yay. If one got saved, it was worth it. But I wonder how many it scattered. That, that is the full bloom. Because I don't want to be part of them people. That That's is the full bloom of the false seed of go make converts. It's, it's, it's come to fruition. Yeah. Because yeah. the whole idea is is to go scream and, and hope that somebody gives their life to Christ. And that's, and that's true. When I was I said it was like to get me out of hell, but I already knew God loved me. Right. I just hadn't accepted him yet. So, okay, yeah, I get what you're saying. But you're going down the road. All right, yeah, I'm a I Christian. I'm a mature mm -hmm. Christian. And I'm looking over at them people thinking, y'all are stupid. Yes. Yeah. And so, that's what, I think. what are the people that ain't saved thinking? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be one of them. Mm -hmm. oh, exactly. Yeah. And, and the... The thing is, is that we're told to go make disciples. Mm -hmm. See, to make disciples, you have to become personally involved with someone. Your the, the conversion part of making them a disciple has to be a personal type of thing. And God bless them people because they at least out doing something. It also goes about mm -hmm. this. It, it, it misses the whole understanding in the scripture that it's geared to as you go and make disciples. That your life should be a transformative effect to somebody. Without even trying. When you're transformed, they see that, should see that. We were, Jamie and I were talking about that earlier this morning. You know, we, we see ourselves through our faults, our failures, and our, our capacity to sin, and we judge ourselves by that right there. So you don't really see yourself oftentimes you know, which we shouldn't be this way, and we'd have to stay in, in with the Lord and you know and ask Him, you know, let me see myself the way you see me, not as it's for to get built up in pride, but a reality check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but when you see yourself from that standpoint, other people a lot of times can see God in you far easier than you see you God in you. I've had people that have looked at me and went, "Oh, I see Jesus all over you," and I'm like, "What?" Where? <laughs> As someone said, the closest thing I've ever seen, that I've ever seen of Jesus is your life, and I'm like, me, me. <laughs> That's because my perspective is different. Mm -hmm. I see myself from my faults, and it shouldn't be that way. I'm saying that as a a reprimand to myself. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. You can be humble and still accept what's real. So to see yourself as God sees you is not elevating myself up or thinking that I'm something that I'm not. I mean, really, that's what pride is. It's not I'm accepting who I am. It's, it's saying I am more than what he's made me to be. It's like building yourself up, up, and beyond that. And as you spend time with him, that's what he does. He talks to you and he shows you who you are. And that, you know, now that you're mine, this is who you are. Yes. Yes. I still, again, okay, I'm going to stop with this one. Something I saw Dan Moeller say one time, talking about his prayer, I love it. I mean, it goes to just like how our Father sees us. And he said, talked about praying. Some of y'all have heard me say this before. And he said, because his, his bedroom was his closet, you know, so he'd go in there and be proud of dance. Hilarious when he talks about praying. Yeah. Um, he's like a little kid. I'm here. Yep, that's what he did. He said, I opened the door and went, here I come. Yeah. You know, and, and he goes in there and when he got on his knees and he said and, and whenever he looked up from his bed the side of his bed the ceiling was gone and he's looking up in the heaven the throne he said he sees a throne he sees angels all over the place he said it's loud and noisy and they're flying around and some are flying and stuff and, and he said that it's really noisy and the, he said he hears a voice go shh and it got perfectly quiet. And he heard a voice say, my son's come to talk to me. That's how he sees us. Mm -hmm. That's who you are. That's who I am. We well, you know most Christians, we're taught that God won't pay attention to you unless you do something special. 
And when you actually get in the Word and you start believing it, it's like, Daddy? Daddy and he's like, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every time, he's right there. Yeah. You yeah. know, because he said the kingdom of God is within you, yeah. not outside of you, well, hoping it, to get in somehow. Or another. Yes. It, well, once you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's in, around, through, through. That, that's why, see, that, that's what they talked about when Peter was walking through the streets and his shadow would fall on people. People were jumping in the shadow to get healed, and they were. It wasn't his shadow that was healing people. It was the anointing coming. Yeah, it was the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit out from him. And these people saw it as the extent of his shadow, so they were jumping in his shadow and being healed. But that's the, he, he's no respecter of people. He does that for all of us. But people, yep. but the church is still tries to hang on to two different lives. We try to hold on to our old life and then embrace, bring in a new life. Yeah, you can't do that. It doesn't work. And then we wonder why is it that we look like the world? It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, to, when you say stuff a lot, so it's helpful to say stuff out loud. Because when you say stuff out loud. Even the stuff that's like been rattling around in our heads, when you say it out loud, the stupidity of it comes out. And yeah, you say it and you go, did that sound as stupid as I think it sounded? Well, it's like Brother Dan says, whatever you're saying, just imagine Jesus saying this mm -hmm. about himself. And you're like, wait a minute, he didn't do that. Yeah. You know, he doesn't say derogatory things about the people that he gave his life for. He doesn't downgrade, belittle, criticize, or condemn. Mm -hmm. He just, you won't hear that coming out of our Savior's mouth. Y'all get anything out of this? Sorry. Yep. This is what I love about having a small group is that you can teach by bouncing the truth off of everybody. And everybody then starts contributing to the truth. Starts talking about it. And then and it's easier to receive. You, you can you start to see the truth and to in it and, and, are, and are able to receive it. It's, I don't know, to me it's far more effective. I've learned far more the last few years uh, meeting with y'all than I have in the last 40 going to well, thank you. going to a uh, regular church or what you know what we consider the a traditional it's church the we, the yeah 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 and then equipping you to go up yeah equipping the saints i have grown more in the last couple of years than i have since i've been saved mm -hmm. and what makes you, it so i can see a difference in you i can mm -hmm. see a difference in every one of you but what the, makes it weird is all these denominations their founders Guess how they got what they knew? They spent intimate time with the Father and the Holy Spirit. They didn't go about to set out Baptist doctrine or Methodist doctrine or Presbyterian doctrine or Assembly of God doctrine. They just wanted to be intimate with the Father and with the Lord Jesus. Sad how that's changed. Mm -hmm. Now sad how it's, it's like collapsing around their ears because of what they have accepted now yeah. which, which is contrary and you see it you see the mainline denominations split and, and things like that because they're compromising they, they, they're comp well they've compromised for a long time but their compromise has become so obvious and so anti-bible yeah. that it just can't be ignored anymore even to those that have compromised some in the past have, it has gone beyond what they will accept that's why it's. That's why I even. I really just hate even the naming yourself something. Like we are Baptists, we are Methodists, yeah. we are Presbyterian. I hate that. One is a. It, it's simply a denomination. Uh, that it's a division. But the second thing is, is that that tells me when you say that right there, 
it tells me I hold more to a doctrine of a group of people than I do to what is written in the scriptures. That's what it says to me each time. Yeah. Well, I'm glad everybody got something out of it. David, if you want to stop that, thank you guys for joining. We appreciate it.